Hi friends, for today's deep dive, we're gonna be taking a look at Sabbath practices. These are so essential to our growth and our faith, and it's important to realize just how integrated our spiritual and physical and mental lives are, and how much Sabbath prepares us to live faithfully as followers of Jesus Christ. So today we wanna to go back and take a look at the historical and the biblical roots of Sabbath keeping, as well as some practices that may enrich our lives for today. In the beginning, go all the way back to Genesis. In the beginning, God created night and day, land and sea, fish, fowl, animals, plants, and human beings, male and female. And God declared that it was good very good. In six days, God made all of these things out of nothing. And then on the seventh day, God makes nothing out of something. That is to say, God rested. God made Sabbath, Sabbath rest, a part of the created order. You may recall that the literal translation from the creation story begins this way, when God began to create. So creation is an ongoing story of new beginnings and opportunities for a fresh start. God began to create and still is creating. So we see, for example, that even the way Sabbath is observed now has evolved in response to changing circumstances for Jewish and now Christian people. After the destruction of the city of Jerusalem and the temple, the Jews were exiled and they had no place to gather for worship or for the teaching of their faith. Sabbath observances then became part of their weekly ritual, a part of their home life, a part of the community life as it originated out of their worship in the home. And it was such an integral part of who they were that this is the spiritual glue that held them together. Sabbath was a home-based worship experience and it was practical and adaptable. And that's so important for us to realize for today as well, because we're in a similar kind of exile, aren't we? Coronavirus has limited gatherings of all types and we're not able to gather any place for worship or for the teaching of our faith. And so we also find ourselves relying even more on the Sabbath practices that adapt to our conditions now. But as we go back to that word, we're in Genesis, we're told on the seventh day, God finished God's work. It was on the seventh day that God created Manuha, and that's a word that we understand to mean tranquility serenity, peace, rest. All of these such important factors in our Sabbath. And it was not until the Sabbath was created that things were considered complete. Another clarifying reference to Sabbath is found in the 20th chapter of Exodus, where you will recall Moses received and then shared the law, the Ten Commandments, with the people. And in the eighth verse of the 20th chapter, we find the longest commandment that Moses received from God. And it's the only commandment that begins with the word, remember. Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Later in Deuteronomy, uh, a little more is said about this. Remember that you were once slaves in Egypt, but the Lord your God brought you out with his strong hand and powerful arm. That is why the Lord your God has commanded you to rest on the Sabbath day. The concept of the Sabbath is introduced even before the law. And you'll find in Exodus, the 16th chapter, that Moses invites the Hebrews to gather manna, the bread from heaven, on the sixth day, and to take enough for two days, for the sixth as well as the seventh day, and to prepare food for the sixth and also the seventh day, because you won't find anything in the field on the seventh day. 
This is something Moses says over and over again. And he says to them, trust that God will provide for all that you need. Trust that God will provide enough on the sixth day for the seventh. And that out of abundance that God provides, you will know that you are not self-reliant, but that God is the one who is providing for your needs. Well, that was then and still is a hard lesson that God will provide enough and we can trust in God's hand. How did they keep the Sabbath holy? Holy means set apart. The seventh day is set apart by our affirmation of our relationship to God. It's set apart as we remember who we are and whose we are. It's set apart as we remember that we're made in God's image and that we're beloved members of God's family, that God cares for us and provides for us. It's set apart as a day of restraint. Now, this is important. And again, part of that very, very hard lesson. We don't rest out of weariness or, or weakness, but rather we give up the things that we normally do, the normal striving that goes on to produce and to feel worthy and to connect with other people and with God. We have every opportunity to impress God six days of the week, but on the seventh, we allow God to impress us. And that's the point of the commandment, to, resist, to remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. So as we understand the roots of this spiritual practice in the Jewish tradition, we also know that the intent of Sabbath rest became distorted. It became bound by laws that were virtually impossible to keep. In Jesus' ministry, he challenged the religious authorities about Sabbath laws more than any other principle of the faith. In Luke's Gospel, the 11th chapter, for example, Jesus is speaking to the legal experts about this very thing when he says, woe to you lawyers, for you load people with burdens hard to bear and you yourselves do not lift a finger to ease them. Jesus healed on the Sabbath, fed the hungry on the Sabbath, cast out demons on the Sabbath, traveled to a place to teach and care for the marginalized on the Sabbath. And all of these things were prohibited by the legalists. But Jesus also was faithful to the intent of the law. The intent of the law, God's original purpose for Sabbath rest. Over and over again, we see how Jesus sought out times of rest and renewal. That Jesus modeled a balanced life of work and rest. And he created, or he rested so that he would be ready for his creative work the next day. He modeled a rhythm of life that we know is ideal for our own health and overall well being. Balance is God's plan for us. We see it in the way that we inhale and exhale, in the work that we do and our need and reliance on rest in the way that we talk and listen. This is a part of Sabbath and an important part of what we do. Now, I want to invite you into the practice of Sabbath now. I'm going to light a candle to remind us just how vital God's presence is with us. The one who is the light of the world, the one who is changing the way we observe the day. I also want to take some of the distractions of my day, like a watch, a cell phone, might be a TV remote, might be a number of other things. And I'm going to put it in a little box, tuck it away, weed out the distractions. Focus now on the things that are important, the things that we say are firm and, and set apart as holy this time. When Jesus challenged the leader's understanding of Sabbath in his day, he was saying to all the people, even to our own day, that this reason for the Sabbath is to honor our relationship to God. Now, there is no one right way to observe Sabbath. 
as I move through this conversation, I want to invite you to think. No rules, just right. It was over-regulating the Sabbath that led to division and drudgery and dread. We don't want to go there. Sabbath is a refuge, not a prison. As I think about Sabbath, probably like a lot of you, I think of going to church. And it's a good thought. It's a good way to observe our Sabbath day. But it's not the only way, and especially when we can't go to church. We may worship in the comfort of our homes. We may be able to do a lot virtually online. But a Sabbath practice is not limited to Sunday, nor to the one hour that we spend in the church. In fact, today, Sabbath practices offer us a great freedom to experiment and to remember who we are and whose we are, and how we rest our bodies, our minds, from the busyness of all the other days of the week. It's God's gift to us to refresh our spirits. Now, a few practices I've learned, and, and don't always practice, but I want to offer this as a word to you. The author of 24-6, the book, 24-6, Matthew Sleeth, says that Sabbath is stop day, stop day. The day we stop thinking that we can't stop. We're tempted to believe that we live in a 24 seven world and that we are without limits and that I'm the only one who can do what I do. Yeah, that's what we need to stop. All of those things. We need to believe that God will continue to let the world spin and that life will go on even if we stop. As Sleeth says, Sabbath is a time to transition from human doings to human beings. Now it can be any day of the week, as I said, not just a Sunday. And it may be if you're just starting Sabbath practices, setting aside a couple of hours in your week, maybe 24, but if you need to start somewhere, start with a couple of hours, but set it aside as a regular time, a time when you really seek rest. Allow yourself to turn off the brain's engagement in the tasks of the day and to really be with God. What is it in your memory that gave you that spark, that realization that God was indeed with you? Where have you felt so connected to God that you wanted to repeat the experience? It may have been in a shared meal with family, the people who are closest to you. It may have been in a walk through a park. It may have been tending to your own garden. Wherever and in whatever circumstance you found yourself really connecting with God, that could be a part of your regular Sabbath observance. Whatever you can name as that circumstance for you, allow that to become where you disengage from the world and engage more fully with God. I light a candle to remind myself of the one who is the light of the world, the one whose warmth draws me into fellowship and binds me one to another, the one who is for me a focal point in my day-to-day -day life, a focal point, whether it is something observed in nature or a reflection on the living word that we have in scripture and among us through prayer. I may begin my time with prayer, just asking that God would be with me and that God's spirit would fill my home with hope and love. There might be an opportunity to reflect on scripture, but I got to tell you, one of my favorite classes in seminary was actually, um, I don't remember now the title of it, but it was essentially reflecting on the themes of scripture or the themes of our faith through extra biblical, non-biblical resources. It might have been stories, poetry, um, stage plays. And 
in some ways, reading or even watching a television program or a movie can be a good practice for our Sabbath time. If we choose to have our Sabbath around the table and around a meal, how like the early days of the Hebrew people when they gathered around a table and remembered, remembered that they once were slaves in Egypt and that it was God who led them out, who led them to freedom, and that all of this was God's gift. As we savor food, it reminds us of the presence of God, the abundance of God, the provision of God, the strength of God, and that we don't have to do it all ourselves. You know, as we talk about practices of Sabbath keeping, they're as varied as are our personalities. I think the important thing is to envision a way that we can connect with God and let go of the concerns and cares of the world. Is taking a nap the most important thing that you can do? Then take a nap. Take a nap to really rest mind and body. Do something or do nothing. But the important thing is to let go of the things that preoccupy your thoughts and your actions day in and day out. It doesn't matter how long, two hours or 24. A good friend of mine who practices Sabbath on a weekly basis said, I had to recognize that I was resting from information overload, a hurtful work environment, and my own workaholism. That's a boatload. But in this practice, there has come not only the benefit to her faith, but also benefits to her overall health. We know that uh, Sabbath practices will extend life. And we know that long life is directly related to sa Sabbath practices because studies have been done to confirm that. Seventh-day Adventists, for example, live on average 12 years longer than others. And the number of extra years is directly related to the number of days, that is the weeks out of the year, that they spend Sabbath keeping. We also know that our resting heart rate is a key indicator of our faith or of our health rather. And if we are able to keep our resting heart rate relatively low, as we do when we indeed rest, then our overall health is greater. A well-established rhythm of life, a balance is vital to all of us. I think about a couple of other uh, resources that have been helpful in establishing Sabbath practices for me. One is a hymn that I just find absolutely beautiful, and it's in our Faith We Sing supplement. So I want to call to mind this hymn as we close. Come and find the quiet center. That's the name of it, and you'll find it in the Faith We Sing. Come and find the quiet center in the crowded life we lead. Find the room for hope to enter. Find the frame where we are freed. Clear the chaos and the clutter. Clear our eyes that we can see all the things that really matter. Be at peace and simply be. Silence is a friend who claims us, cools the heat and slows the pace. God it is who speaks and names us, knows our being, touches base. Making space within our thinking, lifting shades to show the sun, raising courage when we're shrinking, finding scope for faith begun. Happy Sabbath, friends. God bless you.